but I promised that I would I promised that I would make this available online. So that's why I thought I would record it. And even though it's just a small group, um, as best we can to pick up any conversation. Uh, I'm pretty sure that my voice carries and I'm right next to her. But when we start talking, we're going to clip it on the tissue box and pass it back and forth. Marcia knows I do this. Um, so that it can get close enough for you so that the recording isn't boring when someone's listening and suddenly there's a long blank, nothing's going on. But so I can orient you to how we do the room. <clears throat> Usually I will give people an opportunity online. I set this up, as you probably saw, and you click in to be able to join it. And it's an orientation about entering the virtual room. Now, Judith and I are co-presenting, although we, neither will be there, be there. <laughs> um, at the Sigma Theta Talk Conference in Australia about virtual classroom and expanding the doctoral conversation globally. And there are four of us on that paper. And our colleague from Australia that came to your class this way will be presenting the paper on how we set it up here at Malloy College in the room. And she listens or presents from Australia. And Judith has been in England. She actually listened to the um, the tree presentations you guys oh. did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. She listened to the tree presentations um, for the um, for the group. And so what I've tried to do is make connections that expand our work. And in that, we've actually expanded. Some of our doctoral students have made good friends globally. And uh, Eileen Magri is co-authoring a study with my colleague from Australia. So if we can find connections, and she happens to be a pediatric person too. Eileen is the Director of Maternal Child Health at Winthrop. So she was really interested in Linda's family-centered care work uh, and, and joined on that. So, so we're making connections. That's the purpose of making this virtual room. I let people know outside that the room has some um, expectation, so I give a little bit about what to expect in the way this works. I asked Judith if most of what she has to say, she'll say, so even though dialogue is great, we postpone it because it's hard to get everyone in the room heard outside. And I asked people outside, Nancy, when you were with your group, to have some, uh, know what the format is and know the technical limitations. So that if, um, if, the, uh, if you were to join it online, which you certainly can do, please know to mute your microphone so when the dog is barking, it's not coming into the room through the speakers because it's pretty loud and unpleasant when the, when the outside visitors are. So I talk a bit about social courtesy and general consideration. If you need to get up and leave, it's fine. This is really open. Um, and then I show the preview of, of what this mechanism can do. Everything I'm showing here, Marcia can see on the screen. So anytime I change, and I actually think we ought to get everybody equipped with an iPad. You can hear it and you can see it. And it's a beautiful way of learning without having to be in the room. So um, it's, it's tremendous capabilities. And I always do this with the caveat of being able to do it more. I'm trying to make it successful. I minimize the technology. We don't have guys hovering around. Hi, Sheila. Welcome. Hi. Yeah. No problem. No problem. I had a proctor. No problem. No problem. Um, come on closer because it's going to well, be smashed. Actually, um, come up here. Lay in, uh, oh, terrific. I think, um, terrific. They, they just got back from that. Perfect. Test taking so well, Like I said, just bring a little late. Down oh, it's fun. A bit. But what I was, I'm doing the out, outside, I don't know if you've ever joined online before, but I'm recording Judith so that if, if there were, there's no one joining us from outside, and what you'd be able to see, if you'll spin that, Marcia, on the iPad, if you were at home, you'd be seeing what we're doing and you'd okay. be hearing me. As long as I'm speaking clearly enough, which I usually try and test, and I even, I even do a summary afterwards, I think you'll see. Hi, Lane, join us, terrific. Um, no rush. Don't um, I even oh, send out. Have a seat, but sit close or come over here because we have a microphone on Judith. Is this go to me? This is go to me. Yep. Yeah, too much hand cleaner on it. No problem. Oh, Marcia, <laughs> thank you for the sign in sheet. That's great. But if you'll come over close, Elaine, Judith is probably going to have here? a conversation with you. But I want to be able to pick it up on the microphone without passing. Just go to that. 
Anyway, the, this is what you would see if you were outside. And I can even tell you, Elaine, if you look at that laptop right there, you're seeing this. And if you had one of these guys at home, you'd be able to join this meeting from home. I'm trying to build this as a possibility since we are all so busy. And to park and to come is hard. But if we can keep this sort of virtual classroom going, if mm -hmm. your experiences are positive. If you wanted to invite some people, you sure can. They don't have to have a lawyer. No. Nope. No, nope. I need an email address because okay. I send the invitation for each of the meetings. Yeah, that's good, because I know people that would like to. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Well, we're trying to make this expand even more. Um, I'm going to move on and introduce Judith because I promised you all that we'd, we'd do this one in less in an hour as opposed to an hour and a half. And um, Elaine, we're going to meet at 2 as well, right? Yeah, well, yeah. whenever. Whenever, whenever, whatever works, whenever whatever we works for you, Ronnie. Um, I just yeah. want to get this. Um, I'll find Alex. Too. Oh, terrific. Okay. Yeah. terrific. Okay. So, so what I want to do is let you guys know, and I told you you'd be really curious to know about my friend, Miss Judith Hunter, from the UK, and how we met. It's an old citation. An old <laughs> citation. <laughs> um, Judith and I were both interested in pediatrics, and that's why I said you'd, you'd find that. I was the editor of Pediatric Nursing for 25 years. Mm -hmm. So I got to go to a lot of international meetings, and I met some of the leadership in maternal child all over the world. And I have another colleague who's on this paper from Turkey, who's a professor of pediatrics at uh, Ankara at Hetchitepi University. So, so to me, being able to look at, at around the around the world at how people take care of children was yeah. my goal. And and we published a lot of articles that were international articles at the time. Like you published one on on uh, Project 2000, mm -hmm. year two, yeah. Uh, yeah. 2000. Yeah. Nursing, yep. Um, nursing 2000. Hi, Alex. Hi. Just join us, but come up close, because yeah. mi the microphone's on her, and I want to make sure I can pick up conversation. You can sit here. Oh, a nice, close seat. <coughs> so to introduce Judith and give you a really good background of who she is and why I've asked her to come, Marcia has a little hand up, too. Um, at the time, Ms. Sue Burr was the head of pediatric for the Royal College of Nursing, or the senior most That's respected a, the Royal College of Nursing. Person. Yeah. And she said to me, I had to meet this woman, this woman, um, Judy Hunter, who was this twerp, I'm sure, in there, <laughs> and she'll tell you why, um, who was um, a, a member of the Council of the Royal College of Nursing and elected to be chair of the Council of the Royal College of Nursing, which she explained to me at the time was comparable to the elected position as the president of the American Nurses Association. Mm -hmm. And I believed her, because why would she not? And I was just 35. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, and she was a pediatric. She was a children's nurse. So, lie. Absolutely <laughs> never. Um, so, so at the time, she said we would strike it, we would get along well. We did. We've been friends for 20 years. We, she's spoken at various meetings for me, um, and I traveled to visit and, um, her and that sent students mm -hmm. when she was assistant dean at Northumbria, a sent um, uh, president of our Student Nurses Association who met with a group of their students who then brought a virtual classroom back to us. So students to students. So it's been kind of my goal to make a global um, effort, because it takes a little time and planning and time change and all of that. But um, what, what Judith has as a pedigree that I think is important for here is having served in that role with the Royal College and being an active player in the National Health Service, because nursing is employees of the National Health Service. Um, they're able to take a microphone and let people know when they're unhappy. Not necessarily they get heard, but it's a whole <coughs> different organizational structure than in the U.S. and when the ANA is fussing or wants to do something. They don't exactly get the ear of the Department of Health and Human Services because they're provider groups, not part of the system. Mm -hmm. So Judith has been through a few of their various potential um, issues, including um, it, um, Industrial action, industrial action, uh, which is strike, which has never been done in nursing. But no. some of those things that we've lived together with and, and she shared 
have informed me that it's important that we understand what the UK does and, and look to finding ways that we can share and do the, do, she says when the US sneezes, Britain gets That's a cold. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's in my mind some of the basis for where she's going to talk about their initiatives that we can learn and certainly implement. Now she's no longer a children's nurse, but given the role that she played, she was um, awarded the, um, her MBE, which is a member of the British Empire, uh -huh. Uh -huh. met Prince Charles. Had, you didn't have the sword or anything. No, not the sword yet. I have, I haven't got to the sword yet. The sword. I'm, the... I'm, I'm anticipating. <laughs> <laughs> Always hopeful. Always hopeful. Um, so that, um, you know, she can <coughs> talk about England in general, or the UK in general, but she's also the head of nursing and patient safety in the UK now. And that's what I asked her to talk about here, is her, her role in the national initiatives that are countrywide. They sound very familiar to our IHI. Yeah. They sound very familiar to what I know you guys experience. So this conversation is going to be great. I'm going to get you set up, and then um, we'll be able to go from there. I'm not the head of nursing and patient safety for the whole of England. I'm, I work in a a hospital in the northeast of England, which is about three hours north of London, um, about an hour and a half south of Scotland, so it's in the northeast. And we have, uh, the hospital is called City Hospital Sunderland. It's a thousand bedded hospital. It's got um, two main sites, one with a thousand beds on it, and we've got about a mile and a half from us, a specialist eye hospital, <coughs> which um, is a very um, accomplished organization that people will travel to for their eye surgery because the ophthalmologists are fantastic and it's got a really good um, outcome for the patients. It's in a part of the world, I was, I was teaching Marcia's group last evening, um, huge deprivation for our patients, lots of um, industrial disease from when we had um, the industry of coal mining, um, steelworks, mm -hmm. shipyard building, all of that's gone now, and it's a lot of um, call center work. You might even get people calling you from Sunderland because apparently it's a very popular place. People's accents are very popular on the telephone, good at selling apparently. My accent isn't from Sunderland. I live about a mile, uh, an hour's drive south of Sunderland. If my daughter was here, she'd say, oh, you sound very posh anyway, Mum. <laughs> and... Um, it's, it's a very busy organization. We have about 100,000 admissions a year. Um, the average length of stay is about eight days. Pediatric, three pediatric wards and a neonatal intensive care unit. So we have obs and gynae, you know, all of the core services that you would expect. The emergency department where people come to be treated. Um, so clearly people enjoy coming to our hospital. But with all of the same problems um, of any free system, people don't always appreciate what they've got or they demand because they've paid for it through their taxes and even though it's free, it's their health service so they want what they want and sometimes that brings problems in itself. So um, my job there as head of nursing, we have um, a staff of about 4,500 um, in the hospital. <coughs> 3,500 of them will be nurses in some shape or form, um, either qualified nurses or healthcare assistants who work to the, um, the registered nurse, and when I say registered nurse, some people would be registered midwives and midwives only as well. And a couple of years ago, I was asked if, well, I wasn't asked, I was told that my title would also include patient safety as well, because patient safety suddenly became very important globally, and, um, you know, they were looking for some mug, I think, to take that title on, and for some reason, I've got tremendous credibility with the, the, with the clinical on. staff, yeah. <laughs> Um, interesting, uh, our Deputy Medical Director, um, Ian Martin, who's also got national profile on um, the confidential um, perinatal, postnatal inquiries, um, he's also um, taking on patient <coughs> safety. So we're a bit of a powerhouse between us, which is quite good, really. So what I thought I would do today is talk to you about how do I know, as the senior nurse in the organization, that my nurses on the wards and in the departments are actually doing what I expect them to do, in the name of nursing and patient safety. Is that all right with everybody? Um, just because I thought it would be quite quite useful because um, 
I, I, I sometimes wonder myself, having, I was sharing with Marcy last evening, it was last week I dealt with a number of disciplinary situations where nurses had gone off the rails and weren't doing what I thought they ought to be doing. So I thought it's, it's useful to look at the data that I've got in the hospital to prove to me that my colleagues, even though I'm on the other side of the world, are still doing what I think they should be doing. So um, I think this is something that really falls to us all, that you know, the quality, it's, it's absolutely essential that we deliver quality standards of, of nursing care, whatever situation we're practicing in, whatever discipline that we're practicing in. And um, the only way that you can promote safe patient care is to ensure that your high standards are always being practiced by our staff. And what I'm going to do in this, it's quite a short presentation, is to demonstrate how I think we do this in City Hospital Sunderland. I don't think I know because I do check these things. So principles of nursing care, I think, again, the glo nursing across the globe is the same across the globe. Um, Ronnie and I have learned that over the last 20 years. I'm sure many of you have got international friends who are nurses. We're all the same. Um, get us together in a room and we'll all start talking about the same subject matter. Um, problems, problems yeah. yeah. Um, we have a colleague, Ellinda Shields, who's in Australia, professor of nursing there. Her agenda is the same as our agenda. Linda and I have worked together on a number of programs over the years. We have another colleague, if you ever go into Ronnie's office, there's a mug there, I think if it's in your office, Gudrun, who's a, another pediatric nurse in Iceland, and you know, her issues are the same as ours. So regardless really of the discipline you're working in, I know Marcy works in psychiatric health, but um, that you know, in itself, same agenda really, when I talk to my colleagues who've got psychiatric <coughs> issues um, for the patients. So I think you know, my mantra really is to everybody is to always use these four key elements of nursing. They're really simple and really straightforward, but it's amazing how often people don't follow an assessment, thinking of a plan, an implementation and an evaluation. And it's something that we do every day of our lives. It's not just nursing, is it? You know, you get up this morning and you see it's quite a nice day, so you decide what you're going to wear. So it's an assessment of the situation before you even put your clothes on and, and you move that way. Um, if I was at home, I would have assessed perhaps, you know, what I was going to make sure was in the fridge for my husband to cook for the tea um, before I got home. So, you know, you do it all of the time. So trying to ensure that our staff are actually using assessment planning, implementation and evaluation is absolutely critical to me as an individual. And uh, we spend a lot of time reinforcing that message with our nursing staff when they come in to work for us as an organisation. The nurse education system in the UK is about to change. Um, for decades, we were certificate level, then we progressed to diploma level, and in September 2012, all of the new entrants onto the nursing programs will exit as graduates. We're a long way behind yourselves in relation to that. But having participated in a number of um, sessions with Ronnie, our levels of education um, are not that dissimilar to yours, to be perfectly honest. And, um, you know, a lot of the things that we teach at the diploma level are really a graduate standing anyway, or, or even postgraduate standing. And certainly if I go up to the university to teach, I'm, if I'm teaching the undergraduates, I'm not doing a different lecture that I would be doing to the postgraduate people. So it all kind of flows and so, follows. So if all of them are going ahead, then you're actually ahead of us. If they're all going if to be 2012 entry. becomes an entry level yeah. date set, and if it actually succeeds because there's been other initiatives, you're ahead of us. Yeah, all oh, right. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, good. So yeah. I'm very good. active. Good. We have pain yeah. in yeah. Day next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not popular um, because mm -hmm. we still have a movement in our country that believes if you're educated as a nurse, you're too posh to wash. Um, do you understand what I mean? Yeah, you know? Yeah. 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 And I have a real problem with that because I think that, um, yeah, well, I think that the, you know, we're looking after the most vulnerable people. And certainly if I took you around our wards, you'd be thinking, my word, where has she found these patients from? Because they really are sick people that we're looking after. And they need the most um, capable nurse to look after them not just a healthcare assistant who's just um, an automatic um, deliverer of care with people. So um, <coughs> our nurse education system is progressing. 
um, we're a wee bit behind, I think, as well in, in research terms um, than <coughs> perhaps yourselves are some of the time. And um, research tends to be delivered in a lot of research happens in nurse education in London, and it's the centres, the larger centres, attract funding. Um, my organisation, we don't have any nurses doing research. We have nurses who are doing research with doctors, mm -hmm. um, but they're not doing nursing research as such. And at this moment in time, that is not a priority for me, actually, to get nurses to do research within the hospital. My priority is to make sure that we're actually delivering high-quality, safe patient care. And maybe in a few years' time, we'll progress to the research. But I haven't got any funding for that anyway, so uh, don't, don't even worry about it. Yeah, don't even worry about it. So I thought I would just say, um, um, we have a, a hospital information system. I know that um, it's well embedded. It's Meditech that um, is used in a number of American hospitals. It's an American system that we've used for the last um, 15 or so years in Sunderland. We're just about to upgrade to Meditech version 6, which is going to sort out world hunger and uh, world <laughs> peace as well, I'm told. And that every meeting you go to, that is the answer. That is the solution. Don't worry, Judith, Meditech 6 is coming in October. Can't wait. I think I might have to have a month's holiday in October. <laughs> But we have this hospital information system, which I think if you use it, and if, you, if, I, if I say sweat your assets, do you understand what I mean? That if you actually use it, to actually, you can gain all sorts of information out of it. And we don't use it as much as we ought to, to actually check that the care that we're expecting to be delivered is being delivered. And it's a really good instrument, a tool, that we can pull all sorts of information out. I can get reports on every aspect of our thousand patients in our hospital by you know, clicking on a couple of buttons of, of the hospital information system. So I guess if I did want to go down a research methodology, I've got that data there sitting there. I know what patients are coming in, which areas they're coming in from. You know, if I wanted to, I could work with our community health people to target particular areas about respiratory disease, about mental health problems. Um, you know, are the parents, do the parents actually understand the need to remove uh, clothing, to reduce temperature, etc. You could really use that database if you wanted to, to um, improve the entire community population. But as I say, my aim at the moment is to make sure that we're delivering safe quality care to our patients. So I use the hospital information system with my nursing colleagues, with the, um, the 2,000 registered <coughs> nurses or so that we've got in our hospital. Every patient coming in has to be assessed and they have to have that information put into the hospital information system. It's a, a prerequisite. You'll know what a HIST looks like. Mm -hmm. And it draws that information right through, so you're not always having to retype everything. Um, one of my challenges is to get nurses to actually sit with patients and do that real time, mm -hmm. which I think we're going to be able to do when we have our new version 6. Because at the moment, the computers are out on the nurses' station, mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. from where the patients, mm -hmm. yeah, the nurses sit and do this. Yeah. Well, they don't do it all day, but I think that's what people perceive that they actually are doing. Somebody there, yeah. yeah, and it's partly because we've got so few computers um, at ward level. So you're going to have like, are you going to have the computers like we're, bedside? We're going like, to have some. Like, we're going to have some more tough books and things so that we can go okay. and, and oh, talk to good. people. Okay. Yeah, great. we have um, in the bays. We, in, we have some new ward blocks where um, our, we don't have single rooms um, like. You do. We have. Um, we do have a few single rooms, maybe a couple of hundred, but really, and um, the vast majority of patients are nursing in a bay, which would be a room probably a little bit bigger than this, where you'd have four beds. Um, but what we've started to do is to create a mini nurses station yeah. Yeah. in each bay, mm -hmm. so that there's always a nurse in that particular vicinity, yeah. and um, that nurse can then get to know those patients. There's also a bathroom in that bay as well. Um, because um, single gender accommodation is really important for us. It's one of our priorities to make sure that we're not mixing the males and females together. Mm. It's interesting though on our patient real-time feedback, our gynae ward, there's a number of ladies obviously think they're sharing bays with men because uh, only 87% of the patients said that they were in a single sex accommodation. <laughs> the others said that there was men in the room. So I don't know what was going on in that particular ward area, I can tell you. Um, so, you know, we use this hospital information system for, for recording and um, all of the information. Um, 
about the patients because we have to, you know if it isn't written down it hasn't happened mm -hmm. and if it hasn't happened how can you prove to anybody that you've actually been caring for that patient appropriately and that is still a challenging message I think to get through to nurses who think that all of this writing is a bureaucratic waste of time and so it's working with them so that they understand the value of their evaluations um, to the enhancement of that individual's care. The assessments are monitored by our ward managers. Ward managers are ward sisters, they're nurses, they're registered nurses and I expect the ward managers on a daily basis to check that all of the patients on the ward have had their assessments undertaken if they're newly in, if they've um, done the falls, trigger assessment. <coughs> As I explained to Marcia's um, colleagues last evening, we have about 120 patients each month will fall in our hospital. Mm. On an average, um, about 25 people a year will fall and fracture their neck of femur. And we know that the percentage of patients that are going to recover from that is very limiting. So we're doing an awful lot of work in falls prevention. And the first part of falls prevention is to know whether or not a patient's a faller. So the ward sisters are required each day to check that the falls assessment tools are correct that if a patient has fallen, that we've actually reassessed them, and more importantly, that we've, have, we've got a care plan, an implemented care plan in place, that we've got the right equipment, and we've talked to the individual patient and their family about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, nutrition, we use the, uh, the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool, which I'm sure you use as well for patients. Um, uh, they don't call it that. <coughs> the MUST tool. You don't call it, you don't call it must, no. Um, we, again, make sure that our patients have um, a must screening tool completed. These are the adult patients. We don't do the same for children. We do the falls for children because they are always um, tumbling over. But the nutrition screening tool, and if the patient has triggered a two, then it's an automatic referral to the dietetic department. And we monitor that all the way through. So Felicity is the head of dietetics can be saying to me, Judith, um, you know, the, the trend analysis here is correct. We think this is the right number of patients that we're getting referrals for. Or she'll contact me to say, oh, you know, this, this isn't right. We're not getting any referrals from this particular ward. We need to do some focused work with that group of staff. So we're using the data um, to actually make sure that the other allied health professionals, as we refer to them, are actually being drawn into patient care as well. Tissue viability, um, one of my big strong points, making sure that patients, if they're coming in with pressure ulcers, do we know where they've come from? Are we able to work back with our community colleagues? Are we able to, because um, we wouldn't contact the nursing home, but our community colleagues would contact the nursing home where that individual patient had been and make sure that they had the correct education. Um, making sure that our staff are using the correct mattresses, the correct positioning, etc., for patients. And I've got a colleague, um, Sue, who runs the medical equipment library, which is where the mattresses would be drawn from. Now, Sue would be able to triangulate how many mattresses were going out with how many patients are actually coming in with pressure ulcers. And we can start to see whether we've got a problem <coughs> happening, um, which then leads us on to education programs, etc., for nursing staff. I tell them an education by background because everything's got an educational underpinning to it. And the tool, Braden? Braden, we use Braden, yeah, we use Braden. Um, and then early warning scores as well for um, observations of patients, you know, looking at their, uh, their vital signs, looking rapid to see whether they're in rapid pain, response. rapid response, yeah. Um, we have that particular tool. And um, infection prevention and control, so that any patient coming into hospital in the UK has to be swabbed for MRSA. Um, if they've got um, diarrhea, then we have to take a specimen for C. difficile. If we take a specimen within the first 24 hours, it can be attributed back to community acquired. Mm -hmm. We don't get fined for it, but anything post 72 hours, we as a hospital get fined for giving the patient C. difficile. So that is a big focus at the moment for nursing staff. It's really hard. Sorry, um, Elaine's eating a sandwich there, but it's really hard to obtain some of these specimens. As nurses, we always talk about these things over the meal tables. And some of my administrative colleagues don't understand what I'm talking about. So I think my next trick really will be to take them to a ward area to say, 
this is what I'm actually talking about because people think nurses are stupid. How can't they get, why can't they get a specimen? Why can't they do it? Well, it's like this. And so, you know, yeah, it's going to be very graphic. Here's the evidence. So what I'm trying to demonstrate from that is that by using the data that we as nurses have to enter, we can pull out all sorts of different things to see whether or not in the first place <coughs> we're doing what we're expecting people to do, which is to deliver high quality, high safe care for our individual patients. And then in the UK, um, about 10 years ago, the then Prime Minister, I think he was called Tony Blair at the time, <laughs> he hit on the idea that it would be really good in the UK to introduce matrons again. He asked the public what they wanted in the British healthcare system most, and people fondly remembered the matron. The matrons um, were vicious and vile. I remember when I was a student nurse, people wanted the matron back because they thought if you had matron, she would actually be able to keep everybody in charge. So we reintroduced matrons, and to be honest, our matrons, they're senior nurses like we are and they look after a patch. So we've got uh, Pauline's our matron for pediatrics, she's absolutely fabulous. We've got um, you know, um, June's our matron for, for, for a couple of elderly care wards. So they, they look after about three, three wards and perhaps an outpatient area. They haven't got a huge patch, but um, they know their staff, they know their standards of care. And each... Are they administrative or are they medical experts? They're 50-50. They're 50-50. So they're the specialists. Well, well, now the, the hospitals have gone to patient care service directors, yes. or PCS directors. Mm -hmm. like, and that seems to be a similar kind yeah. of way. Yeah. You're expected to be administrative, but also yeah. managed by walking yeah. around. Yes, walking around. Yeah. 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 We have the head nurse, yes. mm -hmm. the nurse manager, yeah. and then we have the administrator who is a nurse, but doesn't spend much time um, on individual units. Yeah. It's the nurse manager on each unit. Mm -hmm. But you also have clinical specialists, right? In particular areas, wounds, and uh, yeah. particular expertise. Yes. yes. Um, there are people who have Tell that other. Tell me. Yes. Yeah. Our clinical specialists would be similar looking after particular things. I'm thinking we've got some vascular clinical specialists, yes. diabetology yeah. clinical specialists. Um, our matrons are 50% sort of administrative, and by administrative I mean staff management, staff support, staff education, um, perhaps looking at complaints, and working with patients and families, supporting the administrative manager who isn't always a nurse. A lot of them are people who've never worked in healthcare who have come in to um, work in a hospital. and. Um, 50% would be some sort of clinical aspect to their role. So um, they may be working with the ward sister on the ward, helping to develop something, or they might be caring for patients, you know, helping new staff in to um, look after individuals. Um, they have to do a daily ward round on each of their ward areas. So again, this can be mixed with clinical and administration. So I would expect them each day to go to uh, their ward areas and to walk around each individual patient, and the, if, if the families are there as well, and engage with the family, engage with the patient, and just check how is it for you, how is your care? Yeah. No, really. I mean, it's so important. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. What a concept. You're right. <laughs> yeah. How is it for you? Um, you know, are we getting things right? Are there any aspects of your care you don't understand? Are there any plans for your discharge? Because we need to keep people moving keep getting them out because we have a thousand beds, we have a hundred thousand admissions a year, we have half a million people that we serve in our population and people are very ill. They just need to, you know, be constantly, let's get you out, get you home. Do you understand what's happening to you? Is your community care sorted out for you so that you're not a revolving door and coming straight back in? Mm -hmm. So it's very much that their role. What are the what are the patient um, surveys like? We're coming on to patient surveys. We're coming on to patient surveys. <laughs> I just don't heard to me. I just and is in. there any um, fines based on that revolving door? Because yes, now there being is. Developed. Yes, there is. You can't come back yep. within forty-eight hours. I think yep. it is without it affecting reimbursement. Yeah, we we have penalties for. Um, it depends what you're coming back in with, but um, if you say have a an operation and come back in with a pulmonary <coughs> embolism within 28 days, 
we get a fine for that. If you come back within 30 days with the same problem that you went out with, then we would be fined for that as well. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we get this patient education right. Do you have to get a fine or are you not using those? Um, we would we would not get some money at yeah. this moment oh, in time, right. Elaine. But it yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, exactly yeah, it's a penalty. Yeah. It's a penalty. Yeah. It's exactly a penalty. The data yeah. That came out yeah. 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 Our own yeah. clinical performance yeah. was sobering. It was horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And even the hospitals that participated didn't do any better yeah. than the ones that didn't. Was, yeah. I had to report email to me from the nurse executive organization. It was like, this yeah. is not good. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not and when you look at this, yeah. you Yeah. And 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 I think it's 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 quite. Sad. I know the, the names of various patients. I'll do. I work um, shifts in our emergency department because I think as a nurse, even though it says head of nursing and patient safety, the only way I truly know what's going on is by putting my uniform on and going and looking in, working alongside the team. And I've got a really good relationship with my staff. They know that um, I'm not an expert, and you know they're the ones who are the experts. I'll go and I'll clean the commodes. I'll go and change the the trolleys, the gurneys, the trolleys, the stretchers. I'll go and clean. I can, yeah, I can do. Um, yeah, I can do. I mean, I'm not bad, really, but you know, I'm quite good. But the patients complain about management, and the staff are all laughing behind the curtains, going, "He's the manager." <laughs> what we call the secret shopper. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Shopper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So when you're working, you know, you, you, you can start to see the same people coming back in time and time again, and you think, ooh, what are we doing about these? Now, you know, again, in the area that we live in, uh, that we work in, the, a lot of the patients who are the people who are coming back in time and time again have no infrastructure, they've got no family, they're often isolated, and, you know, the nature of their disease means that they don't actually understand what it is that we're talking to them about. There's no cognition. So we need to get our messages over simpler than we actually are to people and help them. Um, so our matrons will do this quality assurance daily check. And these are sorts of things that they'll, they'll go and do. They check um, with patients how, how it is for them, check with the families. Look at the environment. Is the environment clean? We've you know, discovered an awful lot about infection control and about environmental loading and how we're cleaning things or not cleaning things. Our cleaners um, are from a private company. We have a contract with a private company, um, but we're not in control of them. So we're looking at better ways of actually improving the cleanliness of the environment. So it's matron's duty to make sure that you know, the high shelves have been damp dusted and the under the beds have been washed and cleaned. And it's all resonating with you here. Yeah? Oh, yes. Yeah, so that's part of their role. And um, they're also there for staff support because, you know, we appreciate it's really hard. It's really, really hard caring for people. Some very difficult people some of the time. We have lovely patients as well, but it's the difficult patients that everybody gets worn down by. Um, so staff support's really, really important because we need to keep our staff coming in to work. Our sickness absence rate's at probably about 4.2%, um, which is not bad compared with what it could be but we'd like it to get it down to about 3% if possible. You know, that would be a huge saving um, if we could reduce staff sickness absence, and it would definitely improve the quality of care. And nursing shortage or job freeze? Well, um, we don't have a job freeze for nursing. You'd be delighted to know we've convinced our chief executive that would be the last thing that he should do, and that's really good. What we do have is a problem with some of our um, general managers who have reduced the qualified nursing staff without actually discussing it with the, um, the nursing team. Mm -hmm. And um, we're busy at this moment in time trying to upskill that group of registered nurses. And we've, we're constantly recruiting staff, which is really good. It's really good. We just need to keep them locked in, make sure that they understand what their expecta our expectations of them are. So would you say you have an, a well um, an equal number of people coming into the profession as those who are oh, yes. going out. Yeah, and I, we find, in, in particularly in my part of the world, there's a lot of us, myself included, our husbands have been made redundant. They've lost their jobs mm. over the last two or three years. Mm. And hello? Hi, who's that? Say hello. Who's hello, Linda. Oh, Linda, good day. Good day. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's nearly one o'clock in the morning here and I couldn't sleep so I've been doing some work when your email came through. <laughs> we were talking about you earlier, your ears must have been burning. <laughs> <laughs> and Judith, you're there. Yes. Yes, good. <laughs> Describe the room. Brilliant. Brilliant. We're just in a little so I've interrupted your is it just a small group of us here. Small group of us here, Linda. We're talking about um, we're talking about um, nursing assurance in the UK. We're talking about City Hospital Sunderland. Oh, good. Okay, <laughs> now it will. <laughs> okay, so we're just saying that um, our nursing workforce we're bringing more people in, and there's less people of the senior of the senior age groups leaving because um, a lot of the males in the northeast of England have been made redundant. I was just explaining, Linda, that I'm a ha I've got a house husband at home, made redundant. Yes, very good. Made redundant. Yes. Um, lost their jobs. So their wives are staying at work longer. Um, so that's, you know, not a bad thing really because I think it, what it's proving to provide for us is a stable, older group of staff and there's nothing better than collective memory Thank you. Of, the, <laughs> of the mature, <laughs> the mature I, I, nurse. Call myself, I, I call myself a dinosaur because there's yeah, not three a dinosaur. Of us, oh, there are three of us left who are, I'm in my position 33 years, but there are only two other people of that yeah. and, and if I brought our matrons here, here yeah, you'd find that our matrons are mature yeah. women. And actually they're all women. You can be a male matron, which I think is a bit of an anathema really. But we're all of a similar age group. We've all got particularly high standards. We know each other very well. We've worked together for you know the, the last 10 years. We know what we want for our patients, which is quality, safe care, and to try and prevent um, readmissions. And try just to make sure that people have a good patient experience whilst they're in hospital. So matrons, um, they have matron-to-matron -matron reports because really they are the front line in the hospital on a day-to-day -day basis, 24 hours a day. There's always one of them around. So if there's a problem, I expect the matrons to hand over to each other in order to um, you know, just provide that continuity and support. Our staffing levels, as I was saying there, um, we ha it has fluctuated up and down, but we undertake quarterly reviews. So um, every three months, there's a review of your staffing levels in your particular area with senior nurses now and your finance person, your human resource uh, or personnel member of staff, the ward sisters, as a collective group, sit around a table like this and discuss what's actually happening. Do we need to have um, anything altered? Do we need to try and make a bid to get any extra funding? What do we need to do? Um, we agree on the levels per ward. The matron will monitor that predictive. So she'll sit down each week to see, are we going to have enough staff next week to care for the patients that we've got coming in? And then twice what a day. What do they use for that, for predicting that? The, it is just literally, at this yes. moment in time, looking at the yes. sheets and trends. Mm -hmm. We have. Are there seasonal, seasonal um, a, specifics? Um, we used to have seasonal specifics. Now we only have one week in July where it's quiet. The mm -hmm. hospital runs at 100% the vast majority mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah, really, really busy. What kind of hours do the nurses work? Are they still the eight-hour shift? Or the some people work, um, some, some areas have elected to work 12-hour shifts, but we're reducing that slowly but surely back down to eight hours. A lot of people would work, want to work 12-hour shifts because it's actually cheaper for your childcare. Oh, yes. Because you would only have oh, yes. to pay three days, or you'd only pay three days childcare, and yeah. then you'd have four days off. Or other people are working, um, <coughs> working three days paid and then working on the flexi bank for other days. So they're actually working far more hours than they ought to. We get paid for working. We're only supposed to work 37 and a half hours a week, mm -hmm. um, which is the European rule. Um, we know people work more than that. Yeah. So we're trying to reduce to get back down to eight-hour shifts because people make mistakes when they're doing the 12-hour mm -hmm. shifts. Mm -hmm. And again, that's one of the things that we've Safety. been able to look at yeah. um, yeah. from the incident reporting system. You can look at your data there. You can work out. The disciplinaries that I was doing last week, I asked to see, I always ask at disciplinary, am I running out of time? No, five minutes. Yeah, um, I always ask um, about sickness absence, about what shifts they've been working and have they been working on the flexi bank because I find there's a trend there of people who get make mistakes or get into trouble 
where they've actually been working way over the amount of hours than they ought to have been working. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And then you have to ask yourself why, which is all about staff support. And um, we monitor sickness absence. Currently, we're, we've been recruiting staff, and we are trying to build up um, a team. We call it a resilience team, which is going to be de is deployed to areas where there's um, staff sickness absence, maternity leave, people up on study leave, so that we can actually overcompensate the number of nurses we've got on a ward, so that we're not having people popping in and popping out to work in different teams because again that leads to mistakes yes. taking place mm -hmm. so we've we've got the support of our board for that which I'm really pleased about but it, you know that didn't come easy we had to negotiate hard and have use all of this data that we've got in order to prove that we needed more staff to come in to um, have the, the quality um, we also to take walkabouts um, I expect the ward managers to do walkabouts you know I expect people to talk to patients and their families um, is make there trends. a routine for rounding? Is it a specific hourly rounding, two hourly rounding? Is it by a clock or are there forms to fill out? Oh, that's totally different to the walkabouts. The walk, these are walkabouts where I would expect people to just go and say, hello, how are you? Was your tea all right? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> we, have, we do have intentional rounding, which is hourly rounding for patients. Yes, there are forms to fill out. And um, that has been, we've been operating that for about six months now in the organization. We need to evaluate it to see whether it's actually helping people or not. But these walkabouts are purely communicative, um, quality checks, making sure that people are um, doing what they say they should do. The senior nursing team, we do go walking about. Nobody knows that we're coming, but we'll just turn up and go and talk to individual patients. It doesn't necessarily happen Monday to Friday. 9 till 5, it might happen on a weekend or on an evening as well, and on nights. The executive team, they'll go out and have walk-arounds with patient, with staff. Usually um, you'll have somebody, you'll buddy them up with the matron so they can go and visit a particular area. And our board, our non-executive directors, we take them out for walk-arounds as well. Um, my, one of my particular areas of, of interest is about the hospital food. And so I took the, um, the board to the kitchens to see the quality of food. I arranged for them to have tastes, tasting sessions, and then went up to the ward to actually um, witness the service of food. And then they had the opportunity to go and talk to the patients about how was it for them. And that has really helped us to increase the quality of food that we prepare for our patients on a daily basis. And the board know exactly what's on the menu and talk about it. And that... that you know, unless you actually get people out of their offices to see and to talk to patients, you'll never really know how was it for you as a patient. Um, then there's internal assurance as well that we deliver, real-time feedback. We have monthly, um, we have a team of volunteers who go out and ask all of the patients across the organization on specific days um, a series of 12 questions. And it'll be about admission, communication, food, was your, was your food hot enough, was there a choice of food? Were you in pain at any time whilst you were in hospital? Did you understand what the doctors and nurses were talking to you about? Are you ready for discharge? Is there anything else you want to share with us? Now that um, has proved to be quite popular with patients in that they're able to actually say it as it is. They're not saying it to hospital staff, it's to volunteers who work um, with the hospital. So it's interview, it's not paper and pencil. It's interview. They write things down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's real time so that, um, you know, it's not a, a Prescani survey oh, no. somebody gets back, gets oh, home in, in, in yeah. two weeks or three weeks and yeah. they're just so glad to be out of the yeah. hospital, they put it in the trash yeah. or... Yeah. Um, well, you don't need to know who fills it out. I have no idea who fills it out. Yeah. Exactly. We do have a national patient survey and when I go back home I guess that the results might be there. <coughs> um, whereas an annual survey where there would be a two week period in June, the patients are in then they will be selected and um, sent a national patient satisfaction survey. Your results sometimes aren't very good on that because I think it's the people who have a, a grudge, they have a, a complaint yeah. to make 
So they uh, often fill those in. If my husband had filled out the survey, everything would have been fine, except I was there living with him for two weeks in the intensive care unit, and it wasn't it was fine. fine. Yeah. And it wasn't fine. Yeah. So yes, I filled yeah. out the press gaining. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, we have instant monitoring, so that and our instant reporting system, when you know there's something happens on a on a ward area, somebody falls, there's an, an error with medication, we monitor all of that. And um, we will then work with particular ward areas if there's some particular issues that we're concerned about. Um, we look at patient complaints and do you know trend theme analysis. We invite um, some complaint patients, some patients who are willing to come and share their stories with the staff into the complaints training, and, and that often helps the individual who feels as if they are making a contribution to improvements. And there's nothing so enriching to have a team of staff listening firsthand to how embarrassing the care has been that we have delivered to that individual patient. Uh, so that, that's another um, opportunity. You mentioned sickness absence. Recruitment and retention, um, you know, looking at whether or not patient, our, our staff are actually willing to stay. Um, if they're going, we do exit interviews with them to try and find out why. And looking at recruitment as well, are we popular? Um, will people come and work for us? Because again, we all know that nurses will say, that's not a good place to work, so don't go there. There's plenty of opportunity for nurses to get work at this moment in time, so um, you know our recruitment is good. Mandatory training, and by mandatory training, that's compulsory training around things like um, moving and handling, um, CPR, um, infection control, fire, and child abuse blood prevention. Child abuse prevention. Yeah. The critical things that staff have to do on, a, on an annual basis, mm -hmm. and we monitor whether or not that's actually being. Um, maintained and I link that through to incident reporting and again if it's a disciplinary hearing because somebody hasn't followed the correct policy for blood transfusion um, for the patient have they actually undertaken any um, transfusion training which is mandatory you can check on our electronic staff record so I'm not having to believe the individual because I already know the answer before they come into the room um, so, you know, we use that data as then as well in order to determine whether or not um, things are, are going according to plan. And then clinical audit. So from a clinical audit perspective, um, we might, bless you, we might um, decide to undertake a particular um, audit. It might be around fractured neck of femurs. It might, it might be tissue fibrosis. You know, we can choose from a, a range of um, clinical audits that we have to do nationally or that we want to undertake um, ourselves. And we triangulate everything, as I say, um, quite easily um, by bringing all of these things together, because most of the systems will actually speak to each other, so you can start to overlay the data that we've got, and then we can determine what action for improvement is actually required. And the action for improvement um, might be um, taking a, a group of staff out for a workshop in order to help them to understand um, or for them to, to express how they want to improve things, but some of their frustrations, offering them some kind of support. It might be that there's a team of staff need to do something specific on complaints training, customer care. We might need to focus down on a meal trolley that perhaps is not functioning properly because the patients have all said all oh, the meals are a bit cold and then when you go to check you know the trolley might not be functioning correctly or you know the area might be not particularly clean because the domestic the cleaner that they keep putting in there hasn't a clue what they're doing with the mops you know various things um, so not of it's rocket science um, but I think what we can do is use the data that we've got that you have to collect anyway uh, in order to you know, look after the patient and use that data as a powerhouse to actually make improvements in quality and safety. So most of my days is spent doing that. So thank you very much so for listening. In, in your role, um, how much of the interprofessional role on patient safety is this? Because I know there's a big movement in our profession right now with team training and with the, um, the team rounding and team uh, family meetings. Um, is it still mostly nursing driven or is it um, becoming more interprofessional? It, it's mostly nurse. It's been a lot of it's been nursing driven, but um, we have um, the a lot of the work that we do is multi professional in that um, 
we have to work, doctors, nurses, and allied health professionals have to work together. <coughs> and it's, it's pulling um, like-minded people together. Mm. And we were fortunate in, in Sunderland, we undertook um, a national program called Leading Improvements in Patient Safety, which is commonly called LIPS. And you can find out all about that if you Google um, the NHS Institute for Innovation. They talk about the LIPS program, and I think it's based on a lot of the I, H, I work. Um, yeah, it's a very similar program to that. And um, we took a multidisciplinary team to that, um, and we worked together in order to make improvement in patient care. And it's it's... It's trying to move out of your silos, really, as a profession, because yeah. we've got a common core, which is all about mm -hmm. the patient, and it's about working together. And um, if you look at the work that we've done on nutrition, we've got the dietetics department, we've got the catering department, we've got finance department, um, medics, nurses, myself. I, I chair that particular group. But um, we all sit around and work together to find a solution to the problem and unless you all work together you're not actually going to be able to do that. So some of it is just about finding who you can work with in the other mm -hmm. disciplines and bringing them in and um, you know I'm not ashamed to say that I'll go and find my mates, I'll go and work with people I know and go and have a coffee with them in their area and um, we pull together and work together to improve things and that's how you have to do, that's what you have to do. I think what I'm going to do is, is I'll open this up to the world because, Linda, I know you're out there. And can you add some insight on Australia and interprofessional education, interprofessional collaboration? Because it's a big buzz term here these days. The interprofessional education, um, certainly where I am over in the West at the moment, is not working terribly well. Uh, what's happening here um, is that because of the differing entry standards of um, the different professions, and I hate to say it, but nursing comes out at the bottom, you, the lecturers running the courses here are saying that they're finding it very difficult to teach in them because half the class ends up bored silly while the other class doesn't understand, other half doesn't understand what's going on. And that's a big, that's a big problem. Uh, well, that's happening. Now, one thing you have to remember here that I'm over in the West, and it is very, very isolated, and um, they don't really interact very much with people in the East of Australia. And you know, Australia is as big as the US, and you can imagine people in, let's say, San Francisco, they're not going to listen to people in Washington. So that's that's the dimensions that we're talking about. Um, there's nothing in between in Australia, <laughs> unlike the, the US where you've got people in between. There's nothing much in between San Francisco or Perth and, and let's say, Sydney. Um, so um, over in the West, they're finding it difficult to implement this um, interprofessional learning within the universities for the health professions. They're trying hard. I can't tell you what it's like in the East, but I will be able to in a couple of months. Time. But you will be in a couple of months. That will be terrific. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I hope you, can, I hope you come to visit. Well, by um, way of closing, too, because um, my group is, uh, I promised I would release them somewhere around 1 o'clock, and you must want to go to bed. But um, I want to, as by way of closing and thanking <coughs> Judith for presenting live, Linda and Judith uh, and I, as I said earlier, and another colleague from Turkey have done this uh, international web kind of conversation in a couple of instances and in coming to class. Linda, thank you again for clicking on just in time. So it would be great to have you. And thank you for being the presenter at the International Sigma Research Conference. Um, Judith and I are not going to be able to go. And so we will, what I'm going to be doing, I, when I started this session, I talked about evaluating using the internet to expand the classroom. And if you guys wouldn't mind, I'm going to send you a, an email web um, s survey that is uh, an evaluation one of how it, how it was. So we have data. And uh, for those of you who've attended this particular webinar, I want to take this moment to thank Judith Hunter for coming live. <laughs> and Linda for joining us. I really do appreciate that. But um, I'm going to oh, close this down and make sure it's recorded correctly. And you have a wonderful, safe trip cross-country. I will. Thanks very much. I'll talk Thank to you, you when I get to much. Queensland. Love to Alan.
Yeah, you too. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye, Judith. Bye.